Welcome to Lasting Recovery. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judy Salinger. Hello, good morning. This is Judy Salinger, and I'm glad that you've joined us today to hear more about substance abuse problems and what you can do to help yourself and others. Today's topic is help for families and friends of substance abusers. So whether you're listening in your car, your home, your office, we've got some helpful ideas for you today. Um, I'm a licensed marriage family therapist, certified addiction specialist, and clinical director of Lasting Recovery, a nationally accredited, holistic, individualized treatment program for substance use disorders, anxiety, depression, and other co-occurring issues that are associated with substance abuse, codependency, some various other uh, problems that occur in these families. So we offer uh, hope and help to help you to believe, as we do, that you can find freedom from alcohol and drugs. So when you look at your intention of what you really want as we go through the program today, you can begin to let go of some of the fear of getting into the solution. It's not as bad as you think. You know, our, our topic today is help for families of substance abusers. And if someone that you love is trapped by an addiction to alcohol, street drugs, prescription drugs, then you need some help as well. Don't just sit there thinking that there's nothing that you can do. There is. Whether it's your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, you can do something, and that something is taking care of yourself. Does it sound selfish? Well, it isn't. Today we're going to cover the recognizing the problem, intervening, treatment, and recovery. You know, every day we read in the paper, online, and on news stories about the effects of substance abuse, and more than half of all adults have a family history of alcoholism or problem drinking. And today we're going to talk to you about your family and the stress of living with addictions. So just as there is a series of chemical reactions taking place in the brain of the alcoholic or the abuser, there's, uh, there's too, also a very um, compulsive-like process that occurs in the family's brains. And when we talk about the families, I'm going to tell you that we're talking about mothers, fathers, kids, um, aunts, uncles, grandparents. And, and the, the family gets caught in this disease. You know, um, we've been talking about addiction here for the last several Mondays. And the addiction process doesn't just affect one person. It affects the entire family. And I want to let you know it's intergenerational, it, that meaning that it's like we have kids today that have substance abuse problems. Maybe your kid has a substance abuse problem. Maybe when you think about it, maybe your, your wife or your husband has a substance abuse problem. And maybe you think about it that maybe your dad was an alcoholic. Maybe your mother was an alcoholic. And so you're thinking about how can I be trapped in this? Maybe they were substance abusers. Maybe they used drugs. Maybe they used heroin. Maybe they used prescription drugs. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how it is that we can help you to uncover and really work with healing yourself so that you don't have to pass this down any longer to your family. So what we know about the process of the the um, the, the alcoholic, the person who's trying to get pleasure, the person who sits there with the drink in your hand and, and um, you're trying to, to get some, some sense of a dopamine rush, trying to feel good with the substance, doesn't necessarily work. Maybe you take some um, Xanax this morning. Maybe you took some pain pills. Um, with the person that is living with you or your children, there's also a compulsive-like process that goes on in their brain. Now, you've probably heard the term codependent. Well, anybody who's raised in an alcoholic family system is codependent. You learn how to adapt to an illusion, and the illusion has been created by the person who has the substance abuse problem who is living in an altered reality. And then you become aware of the problem, how it is, how you would like it to be different, and that begins forming your own sort of illusion about I can't live in this situation if only, if only he would change, I can get going in the morning, I could get over my depression. If only she would change, I wouldn't have to drink so much. So instead of the process um, involving the, the limbic and the, the dopamine system, as it does in the alcoholic, the codependent's brain taps into adrenaline. And 
the, the codependent, the family member who's really struggling with trying to control the, the person who has the alcohol problem, they get into fight or flight, and uh, this part of the brain um, communication network that works in the brain's limbic, si limbic system can just go haywire. So our fight or flight reaction is one of the brain's non-thinking automatic responses or cues to memories that spell danger. So what happens is that when you see a person that you love, for example, pick up the, the bottle that's hidden behind the couch, you get into panic. You think, oh my God, there he goes again. I can't stand it. What am I going to do? And then you try to control it. Put that down, you say. Throw it away. I can't take this anymore. And both people are stressed. They overreact. And what happens is that the, the person who has the substance abuse problem needs more chemical in order to um, calm themselves and to feel good because they are feeling bad about it themselves. And then the person who's not drinking gets into the, the codependency cycle and they're into their fight or flight. Let me tell you a little bit about codependency. Codependency was it was first discovered in, in work with with alcoholic families, and it was really about in the the middle 80s. I know I was working in treatment, and actually working with alcoholic families, and um, I began hearing a little bit more about codependency, because um, and, and more recently it's become clear that people can become codependent when there's no chemical addiction in the family, and uh, some people believe that codependency is a disease. Some people feel like it's a personality disorder. And some people claim that it's a spiritual deficit. Whatever anybody believes doesn't really matter. I, I've always seen it as a dysfunctional relationship we have with ourself um, and that we're trying to, to live in a reality that doesn't exist. So let's just say that the condition of codependence develops from living in a dysfunctional, less than nurturing, more abusive family. Um, John Bradshaw, who is a, a therapist and has done a lot of work in the area of addictions. He says that codependency is a loss of one's inner reality and uh, addiction to an outer reality, hence illusion. It's the, the if it would only be different, we get into perfectionism um, and, and uh, a lot of, of stress. Now, Pia Melody, who's another um, well-known person who's done research around the area of codependency, says that codependency have difficult codependents, excuse me, have difficulty with experiencing appropriate levels of self-esteem. In other words, my self-esteem comes from you. If you would change, then I would feel better. Um, setting some functional boundaries, not realizing um, that they can say yes or no. Uh, then the third thing that she talks about is owning and expressing their own reality. And again, this comes back to my reality is what it is that I think my reality is what it is that I feel. My reality is what it is that, that I'm go that's going on with me and what it is that I need. Um, and the fourth thing is the caretaking of their adult, uh, taking care of their adult needs and wants. And again, if I'm owning and expressing my own reality, I can do that. Um, otherwise, what happens is that I'm trying to fix you and I don't take care of myself. And so this this process of, of a mother and father talking um, I to each other in, in rude ways, being angry or, or even not even talking and just reacting and both people being angry but not talking about it creates some dysfunctional parenting in a family system. Now this can turn into characteristics of a, of a child who has codependent traits and so you know, uh, the, and part of that codependency is, again, you're not talking about what's going on with your feelings. You're trying to figure out what's going on with the other person so that you can predict how to react and how to respond. So your parents may have passed it on to you. I know in my family, my um, uh, father was an alcoholic and his mother was an alcoholic. She died of cirrhosis in her early 40s. And so my father, in his own way, um, tried to do the best that he could, but I was like his his mother, and so he would uh, get mad at me, and I always tried to please him, could never do it. So that affected my ability with my inner relationship with myself many years ago, and I've spent many years healing myself and, and working with other alcoholic families to help heal themselves. So many of the, the um, fight-or-flight responses in the brain's non-thinking 
um, memory gets activated when when we're in this codependent family system and um, and so this is a part of what we're going to talk about today is what is it that you can do to get out of this sort of fight or flight non-reaction thinking that's sort of like those things you know you you put your your hand on the stove and you yank it off and it's hot it's automatic you don't even think about it and this is part of what happens in families today again I'm Judy Salinger this is lasting recovery and we're talking about help for families of substance users. I'm going to give you a number you can can call um, today. You can call us at 858-453-4315, and I'll be telling you this number as we go along in our program. And uh, remember that we're either into the solution or we're in the problem, and there isn't any in between in substance use except denial. So if you feel like... Um, you, you've been a hostage to the substance abuser's problem and you can't let go, well, then you need to give us a call. And um, we're going to get back to our program here talking about um, the substance user's problem and help for the families. Now, when we look at feeling like a hostage to the substance abuser's problem but you can't let go, I'm going to um, just give you some something here that I'm going to ask you what it is that you've been trying to do to get into the solution. Do you beg and plead? Do you fight and argue? Do you give the silent treatment? Do you try to keep track of, of his or her whereabouts? Maybe you supply cash or credit cards hoping that'll fix the situation. Maybe they'll be happier if you do that. Or maybe they're not working and so you take care of them because they've been hung over. Maybe the loved one that you're working with and, and trying to help, do you have to pay their living expenses? Maybe you nag and scream. Maybe you, you lecture or preach. You know, you shouldn't drink. You shouldn't use drugs. Do you say those things? Maybe you make some idle threats. You know, if, if you don't stop this, I'm leaving. I don't know if I can take this any longer. You know, I had a woman come in last week. She said to her husband, she said, you know, I always wanted a husband that would really be a man and really... You know, take take up uh, you know his own life. Be one that would be able to to really, you know, um, take responsibility for his actions. That's the kind of man that I want. Now she'd been married to this man for for more than twenty five years, and um, he got pretty upset about it and hurt. But she's she's in uh, she's going to Al Anon. She's learning how to to um, handle things. But what she does is she, she takes it and makes a threat out of it. It's idle, um, but it's there. Maybe you pay the bills or the debts for that person. Maybe you're, you're buying food for your husband or your wife or your kids. Maybe you buy them clothing because they can't do it for themselves. And, and maybe you keep them confined. And when I talk about being confined, sometimes um, when we work with adolescents or young adults, we see parents trying to control their kids by taking away their phone, taking away their car, locking them in the room, um, putting them on restrictions. Now, these kids could be 16, 17, 18, maybe even up to 21, 22 years old. But parents want to keep them trapped sometimes. And as I, maybe that's what you're trying to do, keep your family member trapped so they won't go drink. I'm remembering a family that they walked around and monitored this um, husband of this, this woman and, and the, the children's father. These were children. They were, they were young adults in their 20s, 30s. And um, they would follow the father along all the time. They would follow him to work. They would follow him into the garage because they wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to have a drink. Maybe you're doing this. You know, they were afraid that this guy was going to go um, get a DUI. And you know what happened when they quit following him? He went out and got a DUI. But it wasn't very bad. It was actually... Uh, a wake-up call for him, and he got treatment. So for more than 20 years, this family had been following him around. Ask yourself, how long have you been living with an alcoholic or someone who had a substance abuse, abuse problem and said you're going to do something about it? How long have you been pleading or bargaining? How long have you been fighting, arguing about it, making idle threats, trying to keep them confined, nagging, screaming? Been a long time? For some families, it can be a very, very long time. I talked to a family yesterday. They've been married 28 years, and um, he came in for some help with a detox. And I asked her if, if 
she had ever been to Al-Anon or if she'd ever sought help. She said no. I said, uh, you know, given his history of, um, he's had over 28 years of substance use, uh, many different drugs and alcohol. I said, uh, what have you been doing? Oh, she said, well, we've just been putting up with it. She's been suffering. You don't have to suffer any longer. You sit there at your kitchen table or you sit there wondering, what am I going to do about it? You don't have to wait 28 years. This woman finally um, got it that maybe there was some help. Someone had given her a, a book to read just about uh, three or four weeks ago. And now her husband's seeking help. What I want to tell you is the person that you're worried about can get better if you do something different. And we're going to be talking about that today. What can you do differently to get that person? It doesn't have to be 28 years. And uh, why call Lasting Recovery? Because Lasting Recovery is going to give you a solution. We've got groups. We've got doctors. We've got therapists. We've got help for you. We've been doing this for a very, very long time. I started running family groups in 1981. And we're going to come back here in just a minute. We're going to talk about help for families of substance users. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you. 